Now we've all heard the phrase, judge not, lest ye be judged. <laughs> judge not, verse 1, or chapter 7, judge not that ye be not judged. We're warned here by St. Matthew not to judge others. For in judging others, in exposing their sin, if we're going to nitpick and we're going to look at somebody else's life and we're going to make a nice little list of everything they got wrong according to our perspective, in judging others and exposing their sin, we are most likely identifying and describing the sin in our very own hearts. Who are we to judge them perhaps for their envy or for their jealousy? Uh, perhaps we are the jealous ones. Perhaps we're identifying the sin within our own hearts. Why don't politicians commonly call out for financial investigations of other politicians? Because no doubt there are skeletons to be found in their own closets. Why don't they want, oh, we need, you know, financial audits and things. Well, they're, they, because they don't want something to happen to them, to someone else, because it might come full circle. They're, we're exposing our own sins. As everyone always says, when you're pointing the finger at somebody else, you got three coming back at you. We are not to judge others. This is a warning for our own safety. Judge not that ye be not judged. How easy when we get into this habit, and it's easy to do, and I'd say we all do it, whether we speak it or not, whether we're gossiping or not, when we are judging someone else, how close is that line when we as imperfect yet redeemed saints, when we're trying to judge someone else, when we're trying to peer into their life, we're trying to, to, to figure out what is it, why are they making those, those decisions, how close are we to bearing false witness? Whether we speak of it or whether it's simply in our mind, when we're judging someone else, when we're enjoying the pastime of looking and, and, and uh, examining their life and, and, and describing all the things they do wrong, how close are we to entering into false witness? thereby violating one of the, the many Ten Commandments. Judge not, as it were, it's saying, judge not or you will be judged. In verse 2, for with what judgment ye judge, however petty you get, that's how it's going to come back to you. If you want to be petty, looking at someone else's sin, sins, when we're sinners just as much, as petty as you are, as fine a detail as you're nitpicking, on one level, that's how fine, how petty our Lord, our Lord would never be petty, but how finely our Lord would look at us, how, how, how specific He will be to pick out our sins. And truly, we're, we're deserving of judgment, even though we're forgiven, we truly sin, but how petty, we're, small we can get with someone else, our Lord, what, for with ju what judgment ye judge, you shall be judged. How simply loving, forgiving, caring, not necessarily accepting of sin, but at least loving the other person through it. For with what love have we been loved? The greatest love of all. Turn if you would please to Psalm 28. Psalm 28 and verse 4. So we have this warning, judge not lest ye be judged. And to the extent that you judge others, I'm saying we're coming at this as fallen people, forgiven and redeemed, but yet we're, we, we carry that sin nature with us. So the warning is, don't judge, or else you will be judged. Psalm 28, verse 4, David here is speaking of the wicked. His adversaries, when he's speaking of the wicked, give them, that is, give to the wicked according to their deeds and according to the wick wickedness of their endeavors. Now you have to understand that if we are sinners, and truly we are, when we say, Lord, punish sinners, as it were, Lord, give to sinners according to their deeds. Well, that applies to us as well. We don't, we don't get a free ticket out of that. The Lord truly judges us for our sins. Now it's covered by the blood of Christ, but that's not an excuse. Gives to sinners everything they deserve. You know, Lord, bring down that judgment upon sinners. Well, we're in that category. And so I say to you, we should be slow to judge someone else. And David, being the, the man after God's own heart that he was, he could pray this prayer. Give them according to their deeds and according to the wickedness of their endeavors. But for you and I, I'm encouraging you, we can't take that and run with it. We should be very very slow in our condemnation of others. We should, we, it is there for us, 
but how slowly we should embark upon it. David was secure in his theology and where he was coming from. So he took that liberty. He took uh, the opportunity to pray an imprecatory prayer upon the sin, the, 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 the wicked, as it were. And we have that available to us, but I'm encouraging you, according to the warning of Matthew 7, how slow we should enter into that realm. It's available for us, but we should take it slow. Because if we're, if, as David's calling upon the wicked, Lord, according to their needs, that, that includes me. I've done, I have sinned. You have sinned. And be slow to condemn others as we would enjoy. It's easy to judge others. Look upon them, despise them. Oh, I see how they're impressed. Oh, let's despise them. It's not necessarily appropriate. Judge not that you be not judged. Anytime the, the sinners broke your law, Lord, bring it down. The full penalty of God's law for those who violate it. Well, that's you and I. Violation of holy law, the hammer of justice. Bring it now, Lord. You and I violated that holy law. We'd be calling judgment upon ourselves. And truly it will come, yet we're under the blood of Christ. But now, is this really what I want God to do? Is, do I really want Him to come that fully, that thoroughly upon those who violated His law? As I have myself. Who deserves that penalty? I deserve that penalty of judgment. Where will that hammer fall? It's going to fall right on me, being a sinner. I'll be the one standing in the, in the need of prayer at that point, as will you. So it could be said on a general level, we as redeemed believers are not capable of proper, holy, and righteous judgment. We're simply not capable of it in our sin nature. Now there is a point at which we, through the influence, through the ability the Holy Spirit gives us, through knowledge of His Word, where we can act in an appropriate manner to judge a situation, to judge others properly and wholly. But the warning here is, is go into it slowly. Be sure you are squared away or else you will enter very quickly into error. You will enter into error. We can't do it right. If we can't do it right, that is if we can't judge right, don't judge at all. If you can't judge something right, don't judge nothing at all, as Thumper may have said. Now, who here uses the phrase, oh, don't judge a book by its cover? Well, you know, throughout life, well, don't, don't judge a book by its cover. Don't judge that book by its cover. You don't know what's on the inside. You don't, don't judge a book by its cover. But what about when the cover of a book says, God lies? If I pick up a book and, and, I, and I look to the, to the heading on it, and it says, God's a liar. I don't need that book. I'm going to judge it by its cover. If, it, if, if there's a book that says, God isn't there, I don't need that book. I don't need to kind of, what are the philosophies driving into this conclusion? Well, you know, perhaps there's some interest here that I should have. I don't need that book. I don't need to read those books. I don't need to ask the author's purpose, the philosophies presented. I will judge these books by their covers. There is an appropriate time for us to, to judge things. But it says, but judge not, or you will be judged. I'm going to use some terms here. I'm going to put it up on the board. So, up to this point in the sermon, I've I've used the term judge. I'm going to get a different one. Yeah, I can't see it. Term judge. All right, I'll get to that in a minute. But judge not, you will be judged. So where does that leave us? If we're going to take this warning, as we appropriately should, where does that leave us to be as accepting and tolerant as the world around us do you see that and even as a, as a kid um, when i would say something inappropriate about how another kid was dressed um, about his clothing or that he had um, spiked hair and i wasn't allowed to or something i was told well, the judge not us to be judged by those around me i can remember it but where does that leave us in the world around us as accepting as tolerant are we to judge they're, they're, is there an appropriate place for it? Don't our society would say, don't judge the man who wears a dress. Uh, don't judge him. And uh, would, would not the heathen be able to run to Matthew seven verses one through five? Don't judge that man. You don't know what's in his heart. He's wearing a dress. That's his business. Don't judge him. That's what our society would like us to believe. 
And yet it, and isn't it easy to fall into the traps of don't, don't judge a book by its cover. Judge not lest you be judged. And I hope to I hope to stay with me. I'm going to define what I believe truly we are how we are to look at this passage. Don't judge a man and a woman living together. There's little little or no stain on that anymore in our society. Men and women living together in sin, there's no there's, there's barely a, a stain to it. Don't judge a thief, you don't know what was in his heart. Don't judge. You don't have a right to judge, is what our society would tell us. No? Pardon me? Judge the act. Judge the act. There would be that. There would be that. You can I'm gonna say you can usually accurately, usually, accurately judge a book by its cover. I'm gonna say usually you can you can you can pretty accurately judge a book by its cover. Scripture itself says, judge not. Don't point out the speck in someone else's eyes, we've seen from Matthew 7, when you have a beam in your own. If you would, please turn to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. John chapter 5 and verse 22, it says, For the Father, uh, God the Father himself, judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Judgment in and of itself is not an evil thing. Christ himself judges, as we know there will be that great judgment at the end of time. Judgment is not an evil thing, but the warning from Matthew 7 indicates to us that it is something we must not enter into lightly. Christ, He's got righteousness. He's got the perfect holiness wherewith He can execute judgment. And whereas, whereas Christ is our example, as we stand in Him, I'm going to say there's a slice of that judgment pie that we can have but, but it's a small slice. We don't go into it lightly. In the Greek, the word for judge, uh, going back to Matthew 7, the word for judge, krino, krino, could be said to mean condemn. Another definition of the term. So if, you, if you're back in Matthew 7 and we read it, it will become slightly clearer. If you would, the term Greek term krino, also defined as condemn, watch it now, condemn not that ye be not condemned. A very negative tone to this term judge. There is an appropriate time for judgment. But the term <clears throat> krino, meaning condemnation, condemn not, that you are not also condemned. Uh, for with what condemnation you condemn, you shall be condemned. So there's a negative aspect to this. It's not a positive uh, judging between a good thing or a bad thing. It's a condemnation. We are not to condemn others. There is one who does condemn, and he is the perfect and righteous and holy God. So if we take this back to Matthew 7 as we are, we would read, condemn not that you be not condemned. Condemnation of others is not our job. There is no such thing as a, a ministry of condemnation. Throughout the church, we have many ministries of food, of food pantry, that sort of thing. There's no such thing as the ministry of condemnation. A brother rising up in church and saying, I'd like to have that ministry of condemnation. Well, many people would probably like to have it, but there's no legitimacy for it. In our lives, in the lives of believers, there's no legitimate place for the ministry of condemnation. It's not our job. The Father Himself committed it, committed it to the Son, and so should we. Commit this condemnation, this negative judgment, to the Son. He is the one uh, to act upon it. Now let's uh, switch gears a bit. There, there was an intro to judge. Judge not, condemn not, that ye be not condemned. If you would, please turn to 1 Kings chapter 3. There was a whole bunch of stuff not to do. Now I hope to give you something to do. 1 Kings chapter 3. Now 
where we learn of Solomon being given the gift of wisdom, of an understanding heart. 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 5 through 12. We'll, we'll, we'll pick up the story. In Gibeon, verse 5, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said, Thou hast shown unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness, and thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. Verse 8, Thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thy so great a people? Verse 10, The speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast thou asked riches for thyself, nor asked the life of thine enemies, that is, death to the enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Verse 12, Behold, I have done according to thy word. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. Again in the Hebrew, for judge is shafat, which means to condemn. So the same, it's a different, obviously a different word in the Hebrew, but the, the definition is the same, which means to condemn, however discern. We're, we're introduced to a new term, where was it from verse, um, uh, verse 9. To judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad. So here we have discern coming from the word bene. Bene, which is to distinguish or understand. Doesn't carry with it this, this negative condemnation, but simply to discern simply means to understand. To distinguish, to just to, to, to find out what are the differences, and to be able to articulate one thing from another. It does not carry with it a negative aspect, which is to distinguish. Now Solomon was placed in a position where he was to judge. As we know, he was judge, and there was an appropriate, ordained sp position for him within the government of that time, and it was ordained. He was required. To condemn. The terminology is here, right? Uh, verse 9, Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to condemn, to judge thy people, that I may understand. He, he, he had to condemn once he understood their case, whatever the situation, the specifics, the details. He would condemn through understanding. Both terms are used. He was required to condemn in his position. You and I are not in this position. You and I are not. However, we can take a piece of this with us, and that is the ability to discern. There is no negative aspect here. There is no condemnation. We are to discern, to understand. Would we with Solomon ask for an understanding heart? How we, uh, we slip into this so easily to condemn others in our own heart, in our own jealousy and means. But yet, this is what Solomon asked for. He knew this was his job to judge, to condemn, but he asked for understanding. Let me understand what I must do. Let me distinguish good and evil. If you would please turn to 1 Kings chapter 4. It's just over a couple pages. 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 29. 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 29 through 31. Simply the, the rest of the story, as it were. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding, exceeding much in largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. 
And Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the east country and all the children and all the wisdom of Egypt, for he was wiser than all men. There we have the understanding. Our Lord truly gave it to him. And if we ask for it, I'm going to say the Lord in part will give us that understanding that we might better serve him and glorify him. Wisdom was the result of this understanding. And with understanding comes not condemnation, but discernment. When we understand something properly, we won't choose to condemn it, but there is an appropriate time to discern. This, this is an evil thing. A man wearing a dress is an evil thing. Now, it's not for me to condemn him. I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to put him in hell. The Lord, the Lord of hosts will make a decision on, on, on an individual's behalf. But I'm going to discern. I'm going to understand I'm going to distinguish the individual who behaves in that fashion. I'm going to discern that's an evil thing he's, he's doing. It's not for me to condemn him, but I'm going to discern in my life that's an evil thing. That's an evil thing. There's, there's room for discernment. As believers, we have four stages of thought. We observe. We observe something. We study it. We, we get the details. We get the parameters. What are we, what are we looking at? We discern it, we understand it through the Word of God, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and then we correct it. So we observe it, we observe uh, society around us, we study society around us, what makes it tick, why is it behaving in this fashion. We discern, we understand, where is it coming from, is this a good thing, is this a bad thing, most of it's bad now, but there are good things about our society. And then we, we seek to correct it, to apply the law of God throughout our daily life. We observe, we st study, we discern, and we correct the four stages of thought. These can happen instantaneously in our mind as we're looking around, or you're at Walmart, uh, wherever you might be. You observe, study, discern, and then you try to correct it through the law of God. This should be true for sin. We <coughs> observe sin. We need to study at least what, you know, what are the details of it, not too specifically, at least find out what it is, discern good or bad, and then, through ministry, uh, seek to correct it, sin in our own lives. Political history, you can observe history. Observe it, study it, discern. Did they do the right thing? Did this president do the right thing? Did that leader do the wrong thing? That king, which do they go? And then correct it. Learn from someone else's mistakes. Observe, study, discern, and correct. If you would, please turn to Matthew 16. Matthew chapter 16, back on into the New Testament. <clears throat> Matthew 16, verses 1 through 4. A little story here of Christ interacting with those around him. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came, and tempting, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. All the miracles, all the wonders that Christ had done still weren't enough. They still wanted that miracle from heaven. And he answered, knowing they wanted to tempt him, he answered and said to them, When it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. Remember the uh, red sky in the morning, sailor take warning, red sky at night, sailor's delight. There, so here we have it. When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. Verse 3, in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O oh, ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. Christ was amongst them. He walked among them. The prophecies from the, from the, the house of David out of, out of Bethlehem, Judah, all of the, of the prophecies fulfilled, they couldn't even see. And these are the political leaders. These are the men who had access to the, to the Old Testament, to the books of the prophets, and they couldn't even see it. They couldn't discern the times. They could read, well, whether it be good, you know, fair weather or not. They could see the sky, but they couldn't understand. They couldn't distinguish, was the time Christ walked among them different than 100 years before that? Was it different than the time of David? Was there a difference? Did they distinguish? They couldn't discern. 
They couldn't understand what was going on. We are, and it says, verse 4, A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left and departed them. Can we discern the times in which we live? I'd like to read a quote, if I can find my Matthew Henry. Here we are. Speaking um, of this of this passage, um, uh, in terms of their their discernment being so bad, do you, do you not see the Messiah that has come? The scepter was departed from Judah. Daniel's weeks, all oh, the mysterious seven, 70 weeks and all that. Daniel's weeks were just expiring. Do the math, and it, and it was foretold. This leads up to it. The 70 weeks were just expiring, yet they regarded not. The miracles Christ wrought and the gathering of the people to him were plain indications that the kingdom of heaven was at hand, that this was the day of their visitation. No, first there are signs of the times by which wise and upright men are enabled to make moral prognostications and so far to understand the motions and methods of providence as from thence to take their measures. Excuse me, I think, oh, uh, measures and to know what Israel ought to do as the men of Issachar. So they missed the boat. You see that? They had all these signs of the times, and yet they couldn't even discern it. I'm going to um, just stay where you're at. First Chronicles, I won't have you turn there. I'm going to turn there real quick. First Chronicles 12 and verse 32 says this. First Chronicles 12, 32. And the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do. The heads of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their command. There was a group of men known as the sons of Issachar that understood their times. The Pharisees, Sadducees, they blew it. The sons of Issachar understood. They could discern what's happening in the, in the life of Israel. What's happening to our, to our politics, to our government. They understood it. It, it might not have been good, but at least they could discern it. Can we be as, as the sons of Issachar, not as the Pharisees and Sadducees who missed it, but can we be sons of Issachar discerning the times in which we live? We get tired enough of how America is being run, don't we? We moan and groan. How America is you know, going to the wastebasket. We moan and groan, but it's a waste of time to simply condemn it. There are those. Um, I listen to talk radio because there's nothing better on KMJ. And all they're doing is condemning. They don't like the illegal problem. They're mildly conservative, as you might say. They don't like the illegal problem. They don't like the health care problem. And all they're really doing is condemning it. But I'm going to say, they don't understand why. They don't understand the illegal problem. Right. They don't understand the health care issue or, or why... Um, it, um, sodomy is on the rise and all this political correctness. They don't discern it. They're, they're, they say we condemn it, but they don't have that heart. These are unsafe men on the radio. They don't have that heart to discern. They don't have the Word of God to discern. And we can fall into that trap as well. Simply condemning it, judging it, judging that. Can we discern it? But for us, we should be understanding. We should understand. Why is Obama president? Because we're godless. That's why it's no, it's no surprise that he's there. We're godless. We understand that. It, it, it saddens us and we mourn, we grieve, but at least let's not fool anybody. We understand why. It's not rocket surgery to understand why <laughs> Obama's president. Why are we going to hell in a handbasket, as it were? We are now openly godless. And it's easy to see that you and I, excuse me, it's now easy to see that. Now, I'm going to say, men, men to admire, for us it's easy. Our society is so bad, anywhere we look, we can nitpick and we can find easy ways to, to, to understand why we're there. But I'm going to say, the men to admire, for you and I, is men who lived in the 1850s. We were just coming off of the Founding Fathers. That era, we had God godly government in place and somewhere between you know 1800 and I'm going to say 1860 with Lincoln's reign somewhere in there we were slipping started to slip 
Now I can't now obviously I can't pinpoint where where it was, but there were men. You have to believe there were men on the street in America who were saying something's changing. Beware, something's changing in our society. In those early years, 1830, 1840, wherever you want to peg it, they were saying something. And these were men of vision. Because at that point they there, there was a godly system. They were in place. And yet man's sin was beginning to eat away at those godly foundations. There were men who understood those times. Now, I don't know their names. I don't know their, their specifics. But I would believe these are men. May we be as wise as those. Even when things looked good, they had enough understanding to know, wait a second, something's changing. Society's changing underneath our feet. Society's crumbling underneath. It's already crumbled for you and I. For any of your lifetimes, it's already crumbled. But men who could see it when it hadn't yet happened. There are men to admire. These are men worth studying if you can find one who is speaking out in those days. Christians must understand the times. Christians must be discerning. Not judgmental necessarily, but discerning. Let's consider discernment in terms of safety. Just what we know to be discerning. If I'm going to you know, make a decision, do I step off the cliff or not? There's a, in terms of safety... To prove how foolish our culture is, think of how prevalent warning labels are. Yeah. People can't discern one thing from another. You've got a gas can that says, do not swallow. Yeah. How stupid do you have to be? And yet that's our culture. It's around us. It's foolishness. The warning labels, do not step on. It's some kind of you know, mower blade or something. Do not step. Warning labels are everywhere. We can't discern anything. We can't understand that this is a fast moving piece of sugar out. I, I shouldn't step there, you know, not put my hand in there. You ever seen the thing with the fingers cut off on a mower or something? Who's stupid enough to do that? We Americans are foolish enough. We can't discern anything. We can't discern that we shouldn't drink gasoline. We have to have a label warning it. That's how, that's how far we are from discernment. Never, never mind political understanding. We can't discern not to drink gasoline. Do not swallow. Fools don't discern. Fools don't discern. Christians must be wiser than the fools of this world. By God's grace, we will at least be wiser than the fools of this world. Surrounding us is foolishness, idiocy. May we be a step wiser than that. By God's grace. We have in our hand the only true source of wisdom and understanding. And yet we are oftentimes no better than the fools of this world. Just fools that we are. Christians don't discern either. And that's why we're in the state we're in. Although our job is not to condemn, we must recognize the appropriate place and necessity for discernment. You should not let someone who has been convicted of a very heinous moral crime to babysit your kids. I should be discerning. And someone might come up to me, don't you judge him. Don't you judge him. Maybe he had you know, mistreated a, 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 you know, a, a child back in his back. But don't you judge him. You don't know what was in his heart. No, I'm going to discern. I'm going to discern that man. He's not, he's not coming over to my house and being alone with my children, my sons. I'm going to discern. Don't throw it all out. Judge not. Let's be judged. You're just judging me. No, I'm discerning. This is a man with evil in his heart. By God's grace, he's repented, but there's evil there. And I'm going to be cautious. There's discernment to be had. We must discern our own error as well as the sins of others in choosing companions. I need to, I need to be able to, to, to look at someone, find out, should this, be, should this be a companion of mine? There was, a, when I was in Ridgecrest, there was a, um, a youth group there of, of uh, one of the other churches in a Bible study, and anyone was welcome to come. So I, I went a couple times, and there was, there was usually this, this young man there. He had on the, the, the dark t-shirt, leather vest with, with metal pins sticking out of it and stuff, and tons of piercings, tattoos everywhere, and yet mo any of the people you ask in the Bible study, the young men who were there, said that this individual who, who dressed very, very, call it satanic, if you will, he had the greatest testimony of anyone. You hear this man talk about the Lord. Oh, 
the testimony he's got. I mean, he's covering all this stuff. He didn't take off that stuff. It was still a part of his life. Oh, the testimony. I've never heard anyone talk about the Lord like him. And yet I need to look at that guy and say, something's wrong. I need to discern. There's something in his heart that is not that is not in tune with Scripture. When he's piercing himself, when he's, when he's putting black stuff on his nails, there's something wrong with his heart. I need to discern that. And yet, and so often, we're, well, you need to accept him. Because he, he's got a testimony. He's saying all the right things. You need to accept him. Be tolerant of him. That's, that's the language of our world. I'm going to discern. I can minister to that man. I can try to reach out to him. Now, not to condemn him, but I need to discern. I, I, I don't need that part. I don't want him to become a part of my life. They're, they're, we call it missionary dating. There's a, there's a thing of missionary friendships. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to hang out with him so I can change him. How often does that work? How often does that work? We're going to hang out with him to try and change him. Be discerning. There's a difference between friendship and fellowship as well. We can befriend someone to minister to them the gospel, but is that fellowship? Am I having him in my house, relaxed with him, just enjoying his company and everything else? There's friendship versus fellowship, and there's the matter of discernment. Who are these people? Body piercing. How can we discern our own errors, the sins of our own hearts? You say, why? Well, you need to discern whether whether your own actions, whether whatever it is you do, whether it's right or not. Please turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter four. Hebrews chapter four. Hebrews chapter four and verse twelve. So how are we to discern? We're not going to condemn ourselves, obviously. But by God's grace, through the ministry of the Word, how can we understand the thoughts and the intents of our own heart? How can we understand if our actions are glorifying to the Lord? How can we discern our own heart? Hebrews 4.12 For the Word of God, the Bible you hold in your hand, is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, of the joints and marrow, and is, that is the Bible, the Bible is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Your Bible that you hold in your hand is that discerner. If you seek it, if you put, put this law in your heart, it will discern. There's a ministry for the Word of God in your life to discern what is good, the thoughts and intents of the heart. It's fascinating when discussing with other people, because I, growing up in a homeschooled home, we were conservative. We were more conservative pretty much than anybody we'd come in contact with. And the interesting part was how quickly other people who looked at us, and, you know, jo my sister Joyce and my mom would be in skirts and dresses, <clears throat> very modest, very lovely to look at, and how quickly the folks looking at us would want to say, well, you know, they want to get into an argument about modesty, and they would say, well, I have a right to wear shorts. I have a right to wear a two-piece bathing suit. I have a right to do this, and don't you judge me because God knows my heart. And they run to that, that conclusion that, well, you know, they can do anything because God knows my heart. How dare you judge me? How dare you judge me? I don't need to judge them. The Word of God will do it. And if they're not applying the Word of God in their life, then I'm going to discern I don't, I don't need to be in fellowship with them. If they're casting the Word of God aside, don't care what it says or not, they're going to behave and act however they want, I don't need to condemn them. I'm going to discern. Their spirit is not in tune with the Word of God. I don't need to go into their life and say, well, your, your skirts are a little too short. Let me, let me show you a verse here. Now, there is a time for exhortation, for, for us to, to confront one another in love. There's a time for that. But, on, but just in general, the Word of God will discern their sin in their own life. And if they're not seeking the Word of God, I need to discern. These aren't, these aren't, these aren't people to fellowship with. I'll be friends, but I'm not going to fellowship with them. The Word of God does the work for us. Our diligence, the Word of God's there. It is a discerner of the hearts and intents, uh, the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God will do that. The diligence for us is in terms of applying it. You and I choose whether or not to bother reading it, putting it, 
making it a part of our lives, ingesting it, as it were. There's where we are to be, applying it diligently. What credibility do we even give the Bible? Does some of you might have not even discern of the thoughts and well, I don't think it can say anything about my heart. Maybe someone scoffs at the Bible. But it will do what it says it will do. The, the <clears throat> diligence or the neglect is on us. The Word of God is available to you. It's available to me. The neglect or the diligence is on us, entirely on us. Turn over, if you would, uh, page to Hebrews 5, verses 12 and 14. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 and 14. For when, for when for the time you ought to be teachers, speaking of maturity or immaturity within the faith, because there's baby Christians who have just come to the Lord, no fault of their own, they're growing in faith, praise God, and there's some who have been in the faith a long time, and there's different levels. We're all growing, but there's different levels, recognizably. Verse 12, so, For when time you ought to be teachers... You have need of that one teach you again, which be the first principles and the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. They're, they're, they're simply remaining babes in Christ. They're not able to grow up and digest the difficult theological issues. Verse 13. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. Simply the, the, the easy verses to understand. The, the words of Christ in red. Just flipping through to find the word of Christ and do your uplifting. That can help. Not to be able to crunch through one of the difficult doctrines. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Verse 14, But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reading of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. It is a shame for you if you've been in the church for a while and you cannot, still cannot, discern good and evil. There are those who have just come to the Lord, who have just come to faith, and they cannot discern. But they're growing. And by God's grace, they will reach that point where they can discern. But it's a shame if you've been in the church long enough to be able to discern and you chose not to. You chose not to apply the law of God to your life. You chose not to spend time reading the Word of God and ingesting it as it were. That's a shame to you that you are not a discerner. There are those growing who will even pass you. They haven't been a Christian as long as you have. They're going to pass you in their ability to discern. That is, that is good for them and bad for you. A shame to you. Every man here should seek that meat of the word. Not satisfied with the milk, but seek the meat for even more discernment. Ever growing in your discernment. Every son must be brought up to discern good and evil. Every wife should pray for her husband's discernment. Every daughter should pray for a discerning husband. Once again, we observe, we study, we discern. We understand. We distinguish good, evil, and then we seek to correct the attitude or the action. Brothers and sisters, pray for an understanding heart, as Solomon did. Pray for discernment. Our world is evidence of life without them. We live in a world without understanding and without discernment. But let us be wise. Let us be wise. Understanding, discerning. Not condemning, but rather loving. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, I ask that you would do a work in each one of our lives that wherever we have fallen into the trap of judging others, of condemning others, Lord, we ask forgiveness for it. It's ever so easy to bear false witness, to nitpick, to find the wrong in others. But Lord, may we, may we forsake the judgment that you have not given to us. But Lord, may we take on discernment. May we be a discerning, a wise, and understanding people. Lord, we must understand the times in which we live. And we can only do that. We can only understand through your help, through your word, and through the ability that you've given us of discernment. So I ask, Lord, that you would help us. May we seek you. May we seek your word above all else. As you do the work of change in our hearts, in Christ's name, amen.